There's something awesome yet eerie about encountering a standing stone in the landscape. Why is it there? Who put it there? And how did they put it there? The fact we often can't answer these questions helps add to their mystery. Standing stones go by a range of names, such as lith, i.e. megalith, or menhir. They're fairly easy to define since they're stones placed in the ground and usually Neolithic or Bronze Age in age. They come in a whole range of shapes and sizes and they have a huge variety of types, markings and engravings. The absence of knowledge about who erected standing stones or why they did so creates a vacuum that folklore is only too happy to fill. Speculation runs rife with these stones. And that's what we're going to have a look at in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are cracking on with our Sacred Places in the Landscape Month, having looked at Holy Wells last week. This week, we are looking at Standing Stones. And I'm going to be honest, the next three weeks are basically all going to be related to stones in some shape or form. So we're looking at Standing Stones this week, Stone Circles next week, and then kind of barrows and chambered tombs and dolmens and all that kind of jazz the week after. And then we're going to be looking at like massive hill figures and so on in the final week of March. I do want to point out that the focus of this episode is going to be the folklore associated with standing stones, not the history. And given the sheer number of stones across Europe, Africa and Asia, I've chosen examples that show different types of legends. There is very much a focus on the British Isles because obviously that is where I am but because it's such a massive topic I can't possibly do it justice in a single podcast episode. I will point out as well that not all of these stones are Neolithic either because a couple of them are slightly more recent but because they accrued folklore all the same I thought it was probably worth including them because it's almost as if people just love coming up with stories for things in the landscape. And as I say, I am doing stone circles next week and that one's going to have a bit more variety of locations because of the fact that you get different stories in different places. But before I go any further, I also want to do a bit of a thank you to Jez Hunt at Ancestor Leathercraft because he basically walked me through like the history of sort of stone circles and barrows and all that kind of thing. He knows a million tons more about this than I do. But without that kind of historical context, a lot of what I was looking at in terms of folklore didn't really make sense. So massive thank you to him for that. But we're going to basically get cracking with Manatol and Main Scriffa in Cornwall. I've probably pronounced them horrifically badly. I am sorry. Now, the Manatol is probably the more famous of the two. It is believed to be Bronze Age, and there are actually four stones in this little group in total. But it's most famous for the upright circular stone. And I saw in a couple of different places, some people said that the name meant hold stone in Cornish. Other people said it was the stone with the hole. But it, you get the idea. Now, according to John Thomas Blight, the stone, and I quote, is supposed to have been originally used for some druidical ceremonies, end quote. Now, obviously, as I've said before, we know next to nothing about the druids, thanks to their habit of not writing things down. Although I will point out that it is true that the druids might have used the stones. We obviously have no way of knowing like how or indeed why they would have done so, but it's just one of those things that you start seeing cropping up quite a lot with stones, or people assume they must be from the Druids, because of course they are. Now the main atoll is more famous in folklore because people might actually pass children with rickets or tuberculosis through the hole to cure their ailments, which explains its local name, the Crick Stone. And it was important to pass the child through three or nine times, both obviously being magical numbers. And apparently pregnant women wanting an easy birth or women wanting to get pregnant also use the stone, although it's not really clear how. I kind of dread to think. But according to Jacqueline Simpson and Steve Rowd, writer W.C. Borlays recalled a farmer telling him in 1749 that people in the area crept through the hole to cure pains in their limbs or back. Now that concept did grow over time with people allegedly using the stone to cure scrofula. 
That said, Simpson and Rowe do point out that it's unlikely anyone with back problems would be able to crawl through the hole. And I must admit, I suffer from sciatica and I I kind of feel like as much as I would do anything to get rid of the pain, I'm not crawling through anything when I have one of the bouts of that. Mostly because I can't actually walk. But there we go. One legend concerned a guardian pixie at the main atoll, which was apparently responsible for these miraculous cures, and a local reported that their mother knew of an instance in which a parent actually passed a changeling through the hole to get their child back. Since the pixie at the stone was benevolent, it could undo the work of malevolent pixies. And to be honest with you, I quite like that one because we often come across so many stories of fairies doing mean things that to find a benevolent one I think is quite cool. Now, half a mile away stands main scriffer or written stone, and it actually has an inscription on it. And it reads, Realabranus Cunavali Filius, meaning the son of Cunaval, Realabran, lies there. Now, Blight suggests that the type of writing suggests the inscription dates to before the mid-6th century. Of course, no one knows who Realabran actually was. There are various different theories about him being Roman and things like that. But a local tradition once held that two warring groups fought a mighty battle nearby. The stone marked the burial place of one of the leaders, and even more fantastical, the stone's length, around nine feet, matched the warrior's height. So that would be quite an impressive warrior to see. In another legend, a local man learned that gold hoards sometimes lay beneath large stones. Wanting to become rich, he dug a huge pit around Main Scriffa. Now it did fall face downward and no one knows if the man found any gold or not but this explains why some antiquarians describe the, the stone as like lying on its face and then others describe it as standing upright. So it is currently upright although it did suffer from vandalism in June 2023 because someone, and I'm trying to be kind here, used petrol to light the top of the stone on fire and then they also dug a four inch hole around the stone's base. Now the fire destroyed lichen on the stone and obviously if you've listened to the fungi episode you'll know how much of a fan girl I am for lichen but I have literally no idea what the culprit thought they were doing by setting a stone on fire and digging a pit round the bottom so unless they also heard the legend that there was gold underneath I honestly can't think what was going through that person's head now we're going to move on to one with a really cool name and this is the devil's jump stone which kind of sounds like it should be a euphemism for something and standing stones obviously naturally accrue their own law because like I say if people don't know what something's for they'll just kind of make something up and the Devil's Jumpstone near Marston Moritain in Bedfordshire is no different. Now, glaciers actually brought the stone here during the Ice Age, which makes it a natural erratic. And I had to look up what that was. It's basically a stone where its chemical composition doesn't match the stone in the local area. At some point, people then stood it up as a standing stone. And at one point, the jumpstone was actually part of a group of three. Now, local tradition explains its name through the time when a farmer was jumping on a Sunday in a nearby field. Jacqueline Simpson and Jennifer Westwood say that that was likely a game of leapfrog, but I'm like, how bored would you have to be that the most fun thing you could do is jumping in a field? Like, again, I'm like, is that a euphemism for something? I don't know. But either way, the devil appeared and took his leap from the church tower, so he obviously decided to join in. He landed on the jump stone, which would be quite impressive, before then carrying away the farmer for breaking the Sabbath. And this is something that I find really interesting or will come back to with stone circles. The number of times stones are associated with people breaking the Sabbath, but then getting punished by the devil, who you would think would like the fact that you were breaking the Sabbath. I don't know. But an alternative version published in 1950 claimed that there was actually three boys who were jumping. Again, not quite sure what they were doing, but there we go. On the site of jumps in near the stone on a Sunday. A stranger wandered over and offered to show them how to leap higher. He completed three high leaps himself, which were so high that it really freaked the boys out. And apparently these leaps were then marked by the three stones before he then seized the three boys and they all vanished in blue flames. So no one knows what happened to them. But the very fact, again, that there's no names or dates or anything attached tells me that that's probably not likely to be true. But it does give quite a cool idea for why it's called the jump stone. And of course, the devil also appears in our next story, and he does kind of appear in these kind of landscape stories quite a lot. But this is about the devil's arrows, which are three standing stones near Borough Bridge in Yorkshire. Now, they stand in an almost straight line running north to south, and one theory claimed that they actually aligned with the summer moonrise. Four stones once stood here until builders then took one for building work. And there are rumours of a fifth, but no one knows where that one went. Now, in the 16th century, William Camden first noted their association with the devil, although sometime later, William Stukely assumed that the Druids were behind the stones, even though they're most likely prehistoric. 
Now the name is arrows or bolts is likely to come from the furrows that they display which are worn into them by wind and rain. And Jennifer Westwood and Jacqueline Simpson suggest that these grooves look like the notches cut into arrows which would then hold the feathers. Now the huge size of these stones suggests that a giant might have used them as tools and obviously the devil is traditionally a gigantic figure in folklore. So one story sees him stand on Howe Hill which is near the fabulous Fountains Abbey and also some seven miles away. No one knows why but he unleashed his arrows in this direction. They fell short and landed when we now find the stones. The fact that the devil then didn't go back to retrieve them to use them again I think is a little bit confusing but there we go. I love these stories where it all comes down to the devil generally being a bit rubbish. So he either drops something, he throws it in a fit of temper or he's just he throws it and it doesn't go far enough. And I just always love the idea that these stories are like, the devil's not very good, is he? But I think that's the subtext we're supposed to take from it. But we also often think of stone circles or barrels, which we are going to cover, as being aligned to celestial events. And you would think that might be a bit harder for single stones to do, because how would you know what's aligned to what? Well, the Thompson Stone on the Simon Side Hills in Northumberland apparently does exactly that. And it takes its name from the late radiologist David Thompson, who discovered the rock in 1987. A hole in the huge boulder apparently lines up with sunset on the summer solstice and there's a really cool photo from the Countryside Charity because they affirm it does actually work and have a photo of it doing so. Now according to Crispy and Oates, the hole aligns with the summer solstice sunset over Yarn's Path Law in the Cheviot and it also aligns with sunrise on the winter solstice with Tymouth Priory. Now while the hole might actually be natural, the rock itself is likely to have been placed there and a pile of rocks form a firm foundation for the stone. Now as Oates points out, it's likely that water over time bored a hole through the rock but because of the fact that the hole sort of goes through horizontally, you do think well water's not famous for going horizontally through things which does suggest that the rock was actually moved and the fact that the stones look like they're propping it up again I think makes it look very deliberate rather than accidental. Now it doesn't actually have any local folklore attached to it as far as I could find, although its location on the Simonside Hills, the home of the Durgar, certainly caught my eye and obviously there is an episode on the Simonside Dwarves way back in the back catalogue. But I did feel that the stone deserved inclusion here purely through its summer solstice alignment. Sadly, without further excavation, we won't know when it was set up, which means that it's difficult to know why it was set up. Also, why it was set up there. Like, it's quite difficult to get to, so you would have to make an effort to go in order to see this quite cool phenomenon. So, again, it does feel quite deliberate. But we're going to go off to Wales for our next one, to the Mindlia Stone, which is a fine example from the Banai Buhainiog, where it sits in Moorland in the Forest Fower. And it's over 12 feet tall. And if you see photos of it, it does look really impressive because where it is, you because it's in moorland, you can sort of see it from every direction. Now, it has also attracted more legends than some of the other stones in this episode. And what's really interesting is they're all kind of similar in ideas of what they talk about. So one of them claims that the stone drinks from a nearby stream. And one translation that's been put forward for here is to lick. And mine means stone, which means that mine here is the stone that licks. Which isn't actually as strange as it sounds, because on the summer solstice, the stone's shadow at sunset actually reaches down the hill as far as the Avon here. So you can sort of see where that might come from. A different legend suggests that the stone actually goes to drink from the river Neth whenever a cock crows. Or the stone apparently goes to the river Melter on midsummer morning. So there's quite a lot of different ideas about the stone going to drink from something so there's obviously some kind of link between it and water. Some people think it may have been a geographical marker due to its visibility or it might have marked an ancient track of some way but both Latin and Ogham inscriptions could be seen on its surface as recently as the 1940s which makes it quite cool. There was one suggestion put forward when I was looking at it that thought that perhaps somebody noticed the way that its shadow fell and that's where it got its name from rather than the name dictating where the stone was put rather the name came because where the stone was put interacted with the environment if that makes any kind of sense but we're going to go to Guernsey for our next one because this was a really interesting one and it's also a little bit confusing because there's actually two of them and some articles seem to not really know which one they were talking about but there's a granite slab that's actually carved to create a stylized female figure and as I say there's two of them on Guernsey and on both of them you can make out a crown a necklace and even a belt. Now one of them which is the Castle Men here 
lay undiscovered under the steps of San Marie du Castel Church until 1878. No one knows where it originally stood, although there is a suggestion it was hidden under the church when Christianity came along. Now, a leaflet by the Culture and Leisure Department at Guernsey Museum claims that there was quite deliberate damage done to its right breast, and this was a way to dismiss pagan worship. However, like I say, she's not the only female men here on the island because there's a second one that's less damaged at St Martin's and this one guards the gates of the churchyard. This one does, however, have folklore attached to it because newly married brides and grooms still each leave a coin on the statue before leaving the church to ensure a long, happy marriage. And people also leave flowers at her feet while couples apparently make sure she appears in wedding photos as a lucky guest. She would, of course, also be the only wedding guest in the photos that was at least looking the correct way. But there we go. When I was looking these two up, it was quite interesting because the Castell men here, there's quite a lot of photos of that one where she's been draped in flowers and so on, particularly at things like Beltane. So I thought that was quite cool that people are still interacting with these statues and having some kind of continued relationship with them, which is excellent. But for our final story, I thought I'm going to put one in that's not prehistoric, but it still has stuff attached to it. So this is the Bulford Stone in Wiltshire. And like I say, not all standing stones are necessarily prehistoric and it's sort of interesting to see how some stones can be treated as sacred. And by sacred, I mean as if they've got something going on with them, even when they actually don't. And this one apparently lay in a bend of the river Avon. It was a square block of limestone, so clearly shaped by human hands and set with an iron ring. So obviously for some kind of mooring your boat sort of facility, as it were. Now, somehow it acquired the reputation of being cursed and in the 19th century, a farmer used a team of oxen to haul it from the water to no avail. In 1910, reports claimed further attempts also failed with even 60 oxen unable to shift it. But one writer, J.P. Emsley, claimed that if you turned over the stone, it would actually write itself, which is a bit odd. Now, the authorities did finally remove the stone in the 1960s, although the men selected to do so tried to avoid the assignment because they thought the stone was cursed. So clearly they managed it, oxen or no oxen. But it's quite funny how these stories become attached to things in the landscape. And it's not the only stone in Wiltshire believed to be immovable. People believed another stone at East Noyle had as much below ground as above. And no matter how many horses they used, they couldn't pull it free. But the cool bit about this one is one local claimed that the devil dropped the stone on his way to build Stonehenge. So we see a lot of stuff about the Druids using Stonehenge or building Stonehenge or Merlin building Stonehenge. But I think that was the first time I'd ever come across the idea that the devil was responsible for Stonehenge and I just thought oh that is quite funny but ultimately what do we make of the folklore of standing stones well like I say standing stones themselves are a massive topic and we can only really scratch the surface in a podcast episode that's only 15 minutes long the problem is however not many of the stones actually have extensive legends and they're more like snippets or fragments that someone sort of barely remembered and passed on so you don't have lengthy legends with them as you do with the stone circles or indeed the barrows. There are some common points. They were often apparently thrown by a giant or the devil or dropped by the devil. They're often sometimes considered to be somehow immovable. And I think when you look at ones like the Mayan Clear, you can see why that would be completely immovable because it's massive. And even if you look at the history of them rather than the folklore, local history usually has them marking a burial place or an important location. So even then the folklore is tenuous at best. But strangely, these stories of these stones don't follow the same pattern as stone circles, which often sees people turned into stones, usually for doing something on the Sabbath. And that didn't occur with these stories here, which I thought was interesting. I mean, perhaps the remote location made it less likely for people to invent stories for them because they were less likely to encounter them. And also, we don't know how many stones have actually been removed over the years for building work or to make way for other things. So it's entirely possible that stones that had lots of legends attached to them have been lost. And obviously, again, I could only focus on so many stones in this particular episode. But no matter what we make of standing stones, I think it is fair to say that they do seem to stand like silent sentinels watching over the local area. Though what they're watching for remains a mystery. So I want to know what you think. Are there any standing stones where you live? Obviously, do feel free to let me know. Obviously, tag me in pictures and things because I always like to see them. I also have made a really big point of not including things like the bride stones near Todmorden because they're stones that have been attached to a natural formation 
not stones that have basically been put there by human hands. So that is why I haven't included them, in case anyone's wondering. There is also a exclusive article about them on Patreon as well. So, you know, that's why I, I do have some kind of reason behind what I'm doing. But anyway, don't forget next week, as I say, is stone circles. There will be stone circles that I won't include. I'm not, for example, going to include Stonehenge. I'll just tell you that right now because that will be an episode in and of itself. So I want to have a look at some of the other ones, like the Hurlers, which has been a request. So I want to look at those kind of stone circles and what have you. But anyway, I hope that you enjoyed the episode anyway. As I say, if you do know of any near you, please feel free to let me know. And that also applies to just other stones as well, because one of the other categories of stones that I tried not to include is the stones where they're clearly part of like an old wayfarers cross kind of thing so that either like a coffin rest or they're just like a way marker shaped like a cross i deliberately left those ones out because of the fact they're just not really that interesting but there's loads of them about as well so you might actually live near one of them but anyway i will let you go now and i'll see you next week when we go and have a look at some stone circles cheerio well thanks for listening and i hope you enjoyed that episode If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.